Hello YouTube, Robin Hood Bricks here, and it's train time! Yep, yep, it's still train time. Yep. Ah, oh, there it goes. Cool. Now, you may be forgiven for thinking that I've got enough trains in Brick Nottingham, given that I've got four on just two loops of track, one being the incredibly long cargo train as its own loop, and three passenger trains that share the other, which is uh, this fast passenger train in white, the uh, relatively new Flying Knotsman, which is a steam locomotive that will have carriages in due course, and what I call the Patreon train, which is the modified uh, relatively new one from Lego. Um, yeah, so you may think that I've got enough already, uh, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> I think there's always room to add a bit of variety and add more trains. I mean, they're probably my favourite part of the city. Uh, but what I don't want to do is just buy kind of more Lego stock sets. Uh, and what I mean by that is I don't want to get the Horizon Express set 10233, for example, even though it's an absolutely fabulous set. I also don't want to get the Maersk train, 10219, which is also a fantastic set, uh, partially because they cost an absolute fortune nowadays, uh, but partially because I kind of want to have something new and, well, unique to my city. So what I'm going to do is take some inspiration from real life and real history and, well, make my own unique train. Uh, and it's not going to be another steam one. So what is my inspiration, pulling out of a train shed in these archive pictures? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a bullet train? <laughs> no, it's none of those things. Uh, believe it or not, that whizzing thing on the back is actually a propeller. This is a propeller-powered train. Uh, it's actually called a Schienen Zeppelin or a rail zeppelin translated out of the German. Uh, and it was a train designed in 1930 by Franz Kruckenberg. And it was very revolutionary for its time, as you can imagine, with its aerodynamic streamlined profile and its lightweight design made out of aluminium. Uh, and it actually uh, set a world speed record for trains of 230 kilometers per hour or 143 miles per hour, uh, a record it held for 20 years until 1954 Though I feel that might be unofficial because I couldn't actually find it on Wikipedia's official list of records for railways. Uh, but nonetheless, you can just see <laughs> it's whizzing along and looks absolutely fantastic. That very, very long streamlined body uh, with the propeller on the back make it, well, <laughs> unique. So I'm going to be making this out of Lego. Uh, something that's probably going to be a bit tricky just because of its uh, curved design. Uh, that propeller on the back, of course. And look at all those slopes on the back. Very tricky. So how am I going to build a Lego air-propelled train? Uh, I don't think any combination of gearing on top of a power functions medium motor and a propeller will generate enough thrust to push a train around my track. Nowhere near, I'm sure. So I'm going to have to get a bit sneaky, really, uh, and think outside the box. Uh, what I think I'm going to do is have to have a propeller just for show that's whizzing around but really doing nothing at all. Uh, and hidden underneath, I'll have a conventional train motor that is actually really doing all of the work. And generating enough power to propel a train was a problem they had in real life as well. The first uh, air-propelled train was the Aerowagon, which was a Russian creation in 1921, uh, which had a successful maiden voyage, but uh, on its return leg, it did kill 7 out of 22 of its passengers. So, you know, it had kind of mixed results. Uh, then there was this one, the Schienen Zeppelin. Uh, and then later, the Americans took it a stage further in 1966 by creating the Black Beetle, the M497 jet train. Wow. <laughs> I don't think that was particularly successful either, although it did work. Uh, but all these air-propelled trains suffered from the same problems. Uh, they weren't particularly good at going up a steep gradient because of their power 
mechanism. Uh, they also created a lot of noise and wind from that uh, propeller or jet engine. Uh, and a lot of them, because they had the uh, power bit on the back, were not able to take additional carriages uh, as a normal train would, which meant they were kind of limited to that front carriage on its own, which meant, well, it was limited to 40 people for the Zeppelin. Uh, and it was difficult to reverse, uh, as you might imagine. And, well, with the propeller itself being completely unguarded and unprotected, it was a very big health and safety issue as well, one that the Lego Health and Safety Police definitely wouldn't be very happy with uh, because, well, with this whizzing around at the platform, if you weren't looking where you were standing or where you were walking, you might well, uh, well, <laughs> get into a bit of a sticky situation. So, uh, yeah, they never really caught on. But that's not going to hold me back. Uh, so the way that I'm going to do this, as I said, was to make this spin around uh, in a kind of fake way and then have a regular train engine as well that's actually hidden and providing the uh, real... Uh, uh, power. Now, I do want this to be remote controlled via my IR receiver as I do all of my trains. Uh, so this is essentially the setup I'm going to be doing with a power box here and some mandatory lights for the front as well. So basically when the power is on, the lights will automatically be on uh, as it is hardwired to the battery box. Uh, and then we'll have two channels used uh, for the motors and I figure that if I do it that way then basically I can use one side of my uh, remote control to turn on the propeller and that can be spinning around with it in the station but not having sort of set off yet because perhaps the brakes are on uh, and then when I'm ready it can basically set off using the train motor that will be attached to the second side now I'll just turn both of those off because they're quite noisy. So basically this is going to be all of the electric gubbins that I'm going to be having to hide on the inside. Uh, and that's where my first real design problem comes in because, well, this battery box is quite big uh, and it's going to be very hard to fit that inside a streamlined uh, design. Uh, and that's why, uh, well, one of the main reasons why uh, this is probably one of the hardest ever builds that I've ever done uh, digitally on LDD. In fact, I had to do over 40 versions just to get all of the stuff that needs to go on the inside in it, uh, whilst also being very sort of faithful to the look of the original train itself. So yeah, it was an absolute marathon of work to do, but I am really happy with the outcome, uh, which you'll see mm, relatively soon. Uh, and one compromise I had to make was to change the battery box setup, because this one is just well, too big, too tall specifically. Now, it just so happens that there is a separate type of battery box from the 9 volt era, and it's a lot smaller. Uh, basically, inside is sort of old-fashioned square 9 volt battery, though this is a rechargeable one, and I didn't know these existed like this, but you can actually, if I can get it out, uh, recharge these things through a USB connection. So that's incredibly clever technology, if you ask me. Uh, and then it just slots in there, as you might expect. So yeah, that's what I'm going to be using as the power source for this. But, well, I was naive because I thought that this was completely compatible with all of this. And, well, it isn't. So I've had to make one additional adjustment. And that's because of the IR receiver, which actually uses all four of the channels that are built into the power function system, uh, whereas the old system only kind of had two channels on and off. So as a result of that, I'm going to have to do a bit of a hack that I found online. So what is this hack? Well, first of all, I need a short power functions extension cable just because the different sort of surface on the bottom of this light gray connector can fit onto the old style battery box no problem it's kind of got metal connectors built into the top surface so that is powering this wire and if I did this straight into a motor for example then basically just turning it on well you can see it's <laughs> working already so that's fine but when it goes through uh, the uh, infrared receiver it doesn't work anymore so basically what I need to do is a bit of a hack which is basically joining these two connections on this side together shorting them out uh, and doing the same on this side here before I sandwich them all together in this power stack here now how am I going to do that well I'm going to use tin foil uh, and this is the 
best and easiest conductor to use. And essentially, I'm going to very delicately put, I'm trying to pick it up, it's that small, a very small piece of foil kind of over this boundary here and another one over that boundary there and I don't want them to touch each other because they really won't work uh, and this won't do any damage to uh, any of the equipment uh, but I have to be very careful that it doesn't move when I sandwich it in like that and then just the uh, stud pressure connecting the two blocks together will mean that they're held firmly in place uh, so I'm not going to try and do that on camera uh, but let's uh, pause while I do it in real life Okay, so this is already a massive tangle of wires and it's quite hard to follow, I know, but um, we have now sandwiched those small pieces of foil in this stack of connectors, which means when I turn on this uh, battery box that's a lot smaller than our original one, uh, the lights are automatically hardwired on and that's the first thing that's very important. And then I've got the two motors being controlled by the R controller uh, with one on each side. So we can kind of start the engines and get the propeller going to a high speed. And then we can later start the actual motion on the train engine, which will be hidden underneath and pushing it along. So that is all working rather well. Uh, so this is, well, the electrical side of things finished. <laughs> Easy. Uh, now all I've got to do is make a beautiful looking train for it to all fit inside uh, whilst trying to make it as accurate as I can to the original. Uh, and the first thing that is really pivotal on that, I think, is kind of the face of the train, if you will, or the cockpit. Uh, and it was really important to me that I kind of mirrored the look of the real life train as accurately as possible in Lego. And that's where the set 60164 Sea Rescue Plane from 2017 came in uh, because the cockpit in that set is part 18907, uh, which is this. And I thought that this, with its kind of very horizontal windscreen, but very sort of pointed nose, was absolutely perfect for the original Sheen and Zeppelin. Uh, so see what you think if you can compare that directly with those old photographs. I think it's bang on. Uh, now, unfortunately, that set had trans uh, like blue glass, but this is uh, trans black. And that's because I managed to get that from uh, a couple of uh, space shuttle sets, including 60078 utility shuttle. So it's quite hard getting the right pieces to make this uh, kind of face of the train uh, exactly right. But I think that uh, it was worth the effort to get the most appropriate piece to kind of echo that old yet modern sort of look, if you know what I mean. Uh, now, one thing you'll be immediately noticing as well is that the original was kind of a brushed aluminium type color, very sort of shiny and silver. And there was absolutely no silver pieces that I could use uh, from Lego that would be appropriate. So I'm kind of doing a bit of a conversion from that silvery color to white, uh, where a lot more of the pieces will be available. I mean, the same goes for all the windows and all that that are going to be down the sides. I could use light gray, but I just don't think it looked uh, as good when I was designing it. Right, uh, so we've got the electronics, we've got the train's face. Uh, now I think we need to start with, well, a normal 6x24 train base and kind of build up from there. The design process for this build was very complicated indeed, as I've said, and I think the build is going to be very similar. Uh, but roughly what I'm going for is using a normal 6x24 train base, which doesn't really matter what colour you have because it's all going to be hidden in due course, uh, with the aerodynamic cockpit at one end and all of the really interesting curved bits with the uh, propeller housing and all the rest of it on the back. Uh, and you can see already why I couldn't use the bigger battery box because just sort of doing a shape like that means it will be sticking right out of the top and that won't do at all. Uh, so to make this work, I'm going to have to kind of lower the front and that will make it look really streamlined with its bottom very uh, close to the tracks indeed, much like on our fast train uh, and all the other ones really that are uh, more angled at the front. And I'll do that by using these kind of angled bracket pieces and that will enable me to attach what is essentially the opposite uh, part of our cockpit, the bottom, uh, and then our cockpit will go on top of it kind of like that. And the nose will look very much like a plane really, but then I guess that's the idea, isn't it? Uh, so then I can add a few more pieces uh, and these are going to be all very important later because they're sort of building up the sides, of course, but um, 
the gaps will tell me exactly where to put other pieces later on. So we've got some there, and then we've got some bits here, and we've got some more bits here. And golly, the amount of fiddling around I had to do uh, in the design process to get this right is just <laughs> unparalleled, I think. I don't think I've ever done that much before. Uh, there's just so little room in here, and you saw with the electrics that we were looking at earlier, just how much I'm going to have to cram in this space. I think I'm going to have to get a degree in origami just to kind of fold all of the wires into the available space, because there won't be much to spare. Uh, but there is some basic plate work just to uh, hold all of the electric stuff inside and some of the walls on the outside. Uh, and then I can start adding to the cockpit here. I'm going to need some of these front base studs to kind of hold the nose cone on in due course. Uh, and then I'm going to add some bits that will take those power functions lights, of course. So I'm going to have those shining in and being held by these kind of headlight bricks, which I've got in red, just so it looks a little bit different. And I have one there and one there. And basically the wires will come in, much like they do on Lego design trains, underneath the uh, driver and then kind of slot into those two holes there. And they'll be held very firmly in position by these two modified bricks as well. Uh, and that's when we can start to add the streamlinedness because if I had this cockpit right about here, it'd be very, very pointy nose, not like the real thing at all. And basically we wouldn't have much roof height for passengers, let alone uh, battery boxes and so on. So I figured quite early it would need to be about that high. Uh, so I thought we could go for sort of studs on side type building uh, for the next section and use some of these curved slopes like this uh, on the sides there. and. That fits very well indeed. Uh, so essentially we're going to have a nose cone that looks like that. Uh, and that means those lights will be shining out just like on the original. Now clearly we need a bit more detail at the front, but I'll do that shortly. Uh, what I'm going to do first is add some brackets to the sides because I want this streamlined look to kind of go over these edges because when we've got kind of the wheels in place, now, we don't want them visible because they weren't on the original. So we kind of want to put some aerodynamic skirts along the sides so we can really bring down the sides and hide all of the wheels and our motor and so on. Uh, so it looks incredibly uh, smooth. Now, I'm going to do that by using these bracket pieces to hold some tiles. And I'm doing that uh, because I don't want it too wide. Obviously, the base is six wide. But if I had too much width, then this train won't fit through all of my tunnels and through my bridges and stuff like that. And uh, they're all basically eight wide. So I can do sort of six and a bit on each side uh, like this, but no more. So that's what I'm going to do on the sides to hold some tiles. And the reason for the gaps, <laughs> I found after having all of these all the way along, uh, that basically all of the wheels basically hit the sides and it wouldn't turn around corners. So basically that gap at the front is so this little bogey can turn its wheels without being uh, without them spoiling on the sides. Uh, and then the same is true of our power functions motor, which will pass the wire through in due course. Uh, and that has got these gaps here. I'll just knock that one off of my hand rather than with the wheels. Uh, but that can kind of get its wheels to go around the track corners as well. So that's why they're like that. Uh, actually, I'll probably keep that like that for now. Uh, so then we can add on the tiles that will hold everything together. And I'm kind of going for a white stripe and then a gray stripe like that, just to give it a bit of a pattern. And the gray kind of echoes back to a degree of the original sort of silver color. Um, but the white obviously will tie in with the rest of the bodywork. So you see that's already covered those holes for the motor wheels. Uh, and then I need to think about uh, adding some doors. So I'm just going to add one more uh, studs worth of tiles there. Kind of straighten those up later, I suppose, but they're looking a bit wonky at the moment. Uh, and I'm going to just have not real working doors because I just haven't got room to do that. I'm going to add some grills. Uh, just as the sort of first hint of a door and we'll continue the door in a different color above here uh, and then I can add some more tiles and then we can have the second passenger door because I think the original had sort of all the uh, 
engine for the propeller in the back and then the passengers were in this bit and it had two or three doors I think but I'm going to have two on mine so that will be the front door uh, and then we can join the curved slope that's on its side with those bracket pieces kind of like that and I'm just going to put some quarter tile quarter round tile type ones on the front there so it looks very sort of streamlined indeed so although some of these are starting to come off just because of me handling it you can kind of see that that's a very aerodynamic side and when it is down on its wheels I'll just try and get this uh, wire out of the way then you can only see the very bottom of the wheels at all so I think that that if I find the cockpit again uh, is going to be roughly what it looks like uh, and a tube down there obviously right so then I can add the other side which I've kind of done in some sub assemblies that will probably fall apart when I try and add them yeah it's not working that well to be honest yeah and there's the second one Let's see if that works that's kind of worked and then I can just join the front again with those tiles that I used on the other side repeated and I think you'll agree that that's looking pretty swish actually with its cockpit on there obviously we still need to do the nose cone uh, and then I will also add this bit which is just some of more uh, of the mechanics that will be going kind of in between the two sets of wheels uh, which I can put on kind of like that uh, and then I'll pass the wire through in a minute uh, and then we can start putting on all of the electric stuff all right so there is the sides pushed down I think as best I can for now uh, and I've put that bit on the underside in between the wheels and it's all looking very sort of low profile and sleek if you ask me looking very nice indeed uh, and I've just added uh, support for where the backward facing motor will go when we've got the propeller on it uh, pass the wire through and then I thought I'd better make a start on the rest of the nose cone. Uh, so the first thing to do is to add the power functions lights into these headlight bricks and they just fit in very well and I can replace them with the wire going over these sort of uh, panel pieces and tiles and so on and ultimately they'll go underneath the driver's seat uh, and pass to the battery box going underneath it which is why these supports are here so that's looking pretty good uh, and then the nose cone uh, which was probably the hardest bit of the entire design to do uh, I must have tried hundreds of different nose cone kind of builds um, even more difficult than what will be all the curved surfaces at the back which you would have thought would be the worst uh, area of the build um, but it was just difficult to get it looking both good in Lego terms, but also quite faithful to the original. And I was trying to do both, uh, yeah, which is easier <laughs> said than done. Uh, so I've got some slopes on there just to fill in a gap. Uh, and I can put some plates on here, which will have the control levers for the driver. They're probably not very realistic <laughs> as to what a real train driver would actually use, but nonetheless, there we go. Uh, and then the rest I'm going to actually attach to the underside of this nose cone. Um, and I can do that like that and the front bit is actually a very shallow two by two slope so that goes on there and then this will connect uh, not at the moment because I haven't got the rest of the building but kind of like that and that I think makes a very similar to the real life version uh, nose cone with <laughs> studs on the side kind of that way studs on the side kind of that way and all sorts of different build directions all dovetailing into one and it also gives me the very beginnings of kind of a red stripe because when I very first did this on the design program and absolutely everything was white including this gray stripe as well it just looked like a big white blob so adding this uh, red stripe and then this gray stripe underneath gives it a lot more interest and detail so that is a very smooth nose cone uh, and then when I want to get into it to either play with the driver or basically uh, turn on the battery box on and off then I can just lift off the entire cockpit front piece and it comes off with part of the nose and none of this is actually uh, very firmly attached in there but it does fit very pleasingly uh, very snugly indeed so that's really good uh, but I guess what we want to see next is a view of the headlights on so let me just dig out the bigger battery box for convenience 
uh, and put that on there and then we can turn on those headlights yeah so that's how it's going to look going forward and i think that's a really important part of any train build getting the lights working uh, i think some that don't allow it very easily are at a real disadvantage so yeah that looks really cool uh, so let's see if we can get on the rest of the electric stuff uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you'll just see how much of a problem I've got with all these wires. Right, so in comes the smaller battery box, the IR receiver and the great big motor. Uh, I'm going to put the cockpit to one side just to give me uh, a bit of space. Put these control sticks down as well. So this wire with the lights on is going to be passed underneath the battery box which will go on these eight studs here. And that means the switch will be available uh, when I kind of lift off that cockpit. You kind of lift it off and you'll be able to stick your finger onto that. And that's very important. Uh, and then this will go directly back over itself into this kind of <laughs> storage area for wires because then this needs to be joined onto this power block here like that. Uh, and then that needs to be joined onto the IR receiver. Uh, and that needs to go on this block here. Uh, and then the <laughs> connection from the train motor can go on there. And then this motor can go on here. Ooh, oh, it's just overhanging there so it doesn't interfere with that bogey plate uh, on the top of the motor. So you can see, wow, what an absolute mess. We've got all of this wire to cram in. And bearing in mind that the roof is going to be, let's see, I've got those control sticks in the way now. Let's put them out of the way. The roof is going to be that high. Uh, yeah, it's going to be quite tricky. But that is the challenge that we have to try and adhere to. Uh, and then let's see if all the electrics are working. So we'll turn that on and the lights are on immediately. So we'll put that there. Uh, and then we can use our remote to say initiate uh, propeller. So we can really crank that up. And I might even gear it so it goes even faster. Uh, and then we can drive the train. Whoa. <laughs> so it is working. Uh, and I think that might be where I have to leave it today just because uh, it's taken ages to get this far to be fair uh, especially with all the editing left to do uh, so what we'll do next time let me just stop that propeller <laughs> what we'll do next time is well all of the origami for wires build all the sides all of the roof and then build that really complicated back uh, that's going to support this and have it hanging out well probably right about out here with all that sort of angled back bit as well so we're probably going to see a lot more of these slopes uh, but I do hope that you enjoyed the build up to here I think you can see it's going to be quite impressive well I am super excited for part two now uh, it's one thing seeing this in Lego Digital Designer all complete and looking fantastic but it's quite another when you build it with real life bricks uh, and have it actually powered and moving around your desk so I'm really excited to see this finished can't get over how long it is and it's going to get considerably longer as well you can just imagine the overhang as it goes around the corners of my railway in Brick Nottingham I think I might have to be moving all sorts of trees and other obstacles uh, just so it can get around I'm not sure um, something to look forward to um, but yeah part two is going to be fantastic and I hope at the end of that part to have the whole thing uh, driving around my track as I say so uh, thanks very much as always for watching it's much appreciated do remember to like comment and subscribe for more awesome lego videos and if you value this channel there are many ways in which you can support it do check out the links in the description below uh, now next time on Robin Hood Bricks we'll have to decide what we're going to do. I'm kind of tempted to plough on with this on Monday. I think you'll probably all agree so I might even get started on that tomorrow. Um, but then we'll do a brick haul on Wednesday and you can still send me a package if you want to to my address which is shown here. And then on Friday, uh, well I'll have to think of something else absolutely amazing to do, won't I? So until then, see you!